If the wheels really come off, how far could the Jazz slide? And maybe it's worth it. That's next on Locked on Jazz. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. It is the March 7th edition of Locked On Jazz. If it all comes undone here and the Jazz can't get the offense going, as we talked about yesterday, how far could they fall in the draft position and the standings? We'll look at that today, and maybe it's worth it. Uh, We'll discuss that as well. Looking at the NBA as a whole, is it possible that defense is the key to success In the NBA, interesting conversation with Matt Mark Dagnall of the Thunder and Will Hardy of the Jazz on how you slow down the stars. The Jazz are seeing two of them tonight in Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic. We'll look at that. And late game watch last night, super interesting, plus we'll play the lottery. That's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. I'm David Locke. I'm the radio voice of the Utah Jazz and Jazz NBA Insider. Glad to have you with us. It's your team every day. We are free and available on all platforms or all apps and on YouTube. You can subscribe, hit the bell button, and join our chat group. Question for you on YouTube today. Like, how far can we fall and what's worth it to you? I'll ask you that question today on YouTube. How far can we fall and is it worth it to you? All right, so I went through the final... 17 games of the season. We're 31 and 34 right now. And looking at the FanDuel at, uh, odds, the Jazz ha- are favored in four games the rest of the way. We're favored against the Kings at home, against the Blazers at home, at San Antonio, and heavily favored against the Spurs. Thunder at home. I've broken up all of our remaining 14 games into odds that are between 0 and 3. Frankly, that's like whether a 3 goes or not, right? Like, odds are between 3 and 7. That's considerably, that's a big odd. That's a big line. And then odds that are 7 plus, like a touchdown. Like, that's a blowout. So, if we look at the games in which the Jazz are actually favored, and you want to look at that, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that everyone's on a back-to-back. We're not favored here for a while, right? Our next time we're favored is home against the Sacramento Kings. So that gets us into a uh, into a, a, a quite a losing streak here to get going. That means we the, the odds are we're, we're against Charlotte, it's .5. So it's not a big line, um, but it is, you know, we're not, we're, that's where it goes. So against the Kings, we're a one-point favorite at home, having been at home on Monday, March 20th. Then we're a favorite again against the Blazers a few nights later. We're a two-point favorite on that. Neither of those do the other team have a back end of a back-to-back. So we're just straight favored off of basically our season Makes you wonder whether those lines might swing by the time we get there. Then we're favored in San Antonio because San Antonio is not good. And then we're favored in the final, second uh, final game of the year against the, or third to final game of the year against the Thunder. And this one we're favored by four. Otherwise, we have four games in which we're a zero to three point dog. Five games in which we're a 3.7 dog. And four games where we're over a touchdown underdog. Like the schedule's hard. So let's say we play chalk and we win four more games the rest of the season. We then finish the year at 35 wins on the year. Where would 35 wins get us in the draft position? Now, Detroit, Houston, San Antonio, and Charlotte simply can't win 35 games. Okay? So the furthest you can drop in draft position is to the fifth pick of this draft. Fifth? Wait, what? 
we could still get the fifth pick of the draft somehow? Okay, that, like, immediately to me, like, was eye-opening when I looked at that. Like, this thing's all such that, like, we could st- – the fifth pick of the draft or the fifth lottery position, which, by the way, the fifth lottery position is a 10.5% chance of the number one pick and a 42% chance of a top five pick, top four pick. Oh, well, wait a sec. Like, that's an in- – as, as we get this close and you look at that number, that gets to be a pretty interesting proposition to me. Like, I can do the analytics on this one. This one gets really interesting. And that's not what, that that's just playing it out, right? That's not even fabricating or altering or resting or doing any of that kind of stuff. Now other teams could do the same, but let's look at who those other teams are. Orlando is 27 and 38. They've they've played really well, played 500 for a long time. They're projected to get to 34 wins. Okay, so that would push us to 6th. Six still gives you a 9% chance of the overall number one and 37% chance for a top four pick. I don't know where the breaks are in this draft. I'm going to have Leaf Tulane on uh, later this week, hopefully, and we're going to have a kind of big breakdown of the draft uh, probably on Thursday's show. Get you ready for the March play. Um, All right, so 35. Magic are projected according to 538 to get to 34, and that has them beating us. The next team is Indiana, who's sixth. They're currently at 29, and 538 projects them to 36 wins. Again, we're talking 35. If we win the four games we're favored and no others, we're at 35. That would be quite, it's, that would be four wins, four and 13 to close, plus whatever we're on right now. So that would be a four and 17 to close. All right, so give me your thoughts. And, like, you hear these possibilities in the chat room. Like, let me know your thoughts on, on the YouTube chat room. Because I hate to say it, but, like, this gets interesting to me. Like, if I turn the focus to, like, we've all been focusing play and play and play and you turn the focus, like, wait wait a sec. We, like, you could get to six? You could get to five? Those are big-time draft positions. The interesting one is that Chicago is seventh in draft position right now, but Orlando has their pick in the dreaded Nikola Vucevic trade. Orlando right now is looking at two top 10 picks and they're loaded. They're like ready. They should have traded for Donovan Mitchell. Um, Chicago has lost seven of 10 and they seem to be coming undone, but Chicago is projected to 37 wins. Our four wins gets us to 35. Washington is currently one game, a half a game behind us and they're projected to win 39 and so are the Thunder. So pretty easy if, like, our losing continues. We slide behind Washington, Oklahoma City. We slide behind Chicago. We're at seven if Chicago, you know, keeps playing. So now we're now we're at seven. Indiana get is the interesting one. They're, like, what are they trying to do? Do they, they could pull a ripcord at some point. But do we, can we, Indiana's projected at 36. Can you slide behind that? And the Magic are, sli- are, Projected at 34 and playing pretty well. Can you slide behind that? Sliding behind 34 would take some, would be quite a little run. If you look at the basketball reference numbers, they're always a little different. They're usually a little more conservative. They have the Pacers also at 36 wins. They have the Wizards at 40 wins. They have the Magic at 34 wins. And they have the Bulls at 38. So they're all in the same ballpark. On the, Frankly, in the West, not going to be hard for us to slide into 13th in the West if, we, if that's what happens. And we just may have, as I said yesterday, we just, the, the war of attrition has just worn us out with various little injuries, trading Mike Conley, Malik Beasley, and Jared Vanderbilt. We're, we're just, you know, we're just, run, we're playing a lot of minutes I said this about a week and a half ago. We're just playing a lot of minutes of guys that were non-rotation players when at the trade deadline. And it's just a hard, it's just, eventually it's too hard to do that. So it's interesting. I mean, it's super interesting. Like, this has just been a wild season of discussions and debates. and. But I'm not going to lie. Like, I, I start looking at, like, the idea that, you can get to fifth or sixth. What a season. 
I mean, what a season that would be. You get Lowry Markkinen, you get Walker Kessler, you get Ochai Apaji, you find out Will Hardy can coach and you still have a top six pick? Wow. That would be incredible. Hey, it'd be really fun to play in the play-in too, but I, I just, I, I felt this way for about 10 days. I think if you've heard the show, the firepower is lacking uh, to be able to get that done. But we get Lowry and we get uh, Jordan back tonight against the Mavericks. So maybe, you know, maybe tomorrow's show is going to have a totally different tint to it after the Jazz upset the Mavericks here in Dallas. Who knows? All right, we'll uh, look at um, a little bit of that matchup and then some big picture NBA stuff. I got a lot of stuff today. Um, but we'll try to get to all of it uh, here on the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. I always appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of the chat room on YouTube and being a part of our community that is the Locked on Jazz community. It's, it's super it's super great to be a part of it. It's going to be a great kind of – we got a lot of fun stuff between now and July. I might have a few too many vacations scheduled, but we have a lot of fun stuff between now and July. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. Our good friends over at Murdoch, I just, you know, I can't appreciate them enough for what they do for uh, Locked On uh, and how long we've been together. I saw Blake the other day at the game. It's just like an old friend at this point. Uh, Really enjoy him, his family, their uh, dedication to excellence and making sure uh, that they always give you the no regrets experience. The Hyundai car, you know, I didn't know a lot about it when we started the sponsorship, what, seven years ago. In the last seven years, I've bought three of them. Uh, I've driven every model they have. I'm always blown away by what I get. I'm always stunned by what you can get for the dollar, the bells and whistles for the dollar. And so I strongly suggest if you're looking for a car, at least drive the Hyundai. See what it's like. Then you can decide whether that's the car you want, whether it's the look you want, whether it's the feel you want, whether it's the brand you want. But I do think you should at least check it out and see what it has to offer. It's all at Murdoch Hyundai, 4646 South State Street, Logan and Linden. Please email me first so I can um, give you the opportunity to um, get a VIP experience over at Murdoch Hyundai. So email me at dlock09 at gmail.com. Mint brownie puff. Mint brownie puff. Yeah, I'm talking Bilt Bar. Limited edition new mint brownie puff is out right now. You've got to try this. It is, and the promo code, this one's at built.com. So use the promo code locked on 15 or locked 15. Uh, feel free to tell me which one's working right now because I'm actually confused. I know I should probably know, but I'm confused. But it's out. It's the mil- mint brownie puff. Uh, should be outstanding. I always love their grasshopper cookie and rust. They've got some other, the brownie, uh, while you're at it, the brownie batter puff is there. Coconut marshmallow puff as well. The new double and chocolate, double chocolate with the new improved flavor. All available for you right now at Built.com. Plus, if you want it more immediately, you can go to your local Sam's Club and grab the 13 box or the 12 box pickup. And you can go to the local Walmart and get a four box you're going to begin to see built more and more of the Walmart today at the four box cookies and cream, double chocolate, coconut puff, Sam Club, grab the 13 bar. I was right, 13 bar uh, at brownie batter or churro. It's all at built.com and the mint brownie puff is out. Thanks so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. I strongly suggest game to game. Oh, I threw a curveball. I love game to game. I like first thing I check every morning, game to game. It's one-minute recaps of all the games that took place the night before. I watched most of them last night. But it's still fun to hear the locals' experts' perspective on all that. All right, so uh, matchup tonight against Dallas. So since Kyrie has joined the team, they're four, or has played, they're 4-5. and five. They're the fourth-ranked offense and the 25th-ranked defense. What's super interesting about them is that's actually what they were beforehand, too. They're the number one half-court offense in the NBA. They're the number one half-court offense in the NBA, averaging 1.1 points per 100 possessions. Or per 110 points per 100 possessions in the half-court since Kyrie. Like, that's a mind-boggling number. But let me see if I can make sense of to you of why that's a mind-boggling number. So, first of all, half-court offense is getting better and better and better and better and better and better and better. Because offense is exploding which is why I begin to wonder whether defense might actually be more important. I was texting with a a coach in the NBA last night, and the discussion a little bit was, so the offense has exploded so much that maybe the way to differentiate yourself is to have a better defense. The top four defenses in the NBA 
are top five differential team. Like, I've always thought plus five is the benchmark by which you're really good. All but Denver that are top five have great defenses. So maybe defenses are mattering more and more, and as the Jazz build, defense really matters. That's kind of a question I have there. But for the season, Dallas has the number one half-court offense at 105 points per 100 possessions. The average half-court offense is .98 points per 100 possessions. Okay? So you get in the half-court, you're let below a point of possession, it makes different shots more valuable, right? Like, that's why if you can get a half-court three, it's pretty valuable if it's 35% shot. If you can get to the rim, it's wildly valuable. If you get to the free-throw line, it's awesome. The floater, not great, but if you're late enough in the shot clock and that's what you get, then maybe that's actually a, an okay shot. You go look at, since they grabbed Kyrie on February 8th, and he has not played every game, so this is not every game that Kyrie has, but their offense is a 110 per 100 possessions. The league average is 90, since then, is 99.8. Like, offenses rise as the season goes on. Offenses get better as the year goes on. So, so crazily enough, we're now at about a point of possession. But they're 10% better than league average. And the 15th ranked team in the league is a 100 Denver in the half court since then. Utah, by the way, if you're wondering, we've slid to 23rd. We were fourth. Or we were about fourth or fifth. They don't offensive rebound, and they play only in the half court. Maybe because they're just that good. This is a, And this gets to the question of, like, what do you do when Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving are on the floor, and how do you possibly defend that? If you let Luka play one-on-one -on -one isolation, you're dead. He's too good. Frankly, if you let Kyrie play one-on-one -on -one isolation, I think you're dead. They're just too good. In fact, the drive, I haven't looked at it recently but or, or haven't prepped it yet for today, but as of like a week ago, the number one and number two drive guys in the NBA on efficiency were Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Luka on an isolation averages 1.11 points per 100 possessions or 1.11 points per chance. Okay, so 111 points per 100 possessions. Like, he's actually better than their half-court offense. That's a crazy number. If you go to what's called points per direct, where suddenly it's the action right off of his pass, it's now 1.15. So this gets into this whole question of, like, how do you, why the offenses are exploding. And, and here's what's happened with Luka this year. Everyone's doubling Luka. He gets off the ball, passes to Bullock, then Dorian Finney-Smith, Spencer Dinwiddie, Tim Hardaway. And then their offense is the number one half-court offense in the league. And then Houston and New York watched this earlier this year, and they're like, okay, well, this is ridiculous. Like, every time you double Luka, you're giving up wide-open threes, which are, like, between 1.15 points and 1.2 points. This is completely absurd. We're not doubling Luka. And then Luka drops 60. Because Luka's that great. Like, I really don't know what you're supposed to do about this. I asked Mark Dagnall and Tim and, and Will Hardy this week, what, what is it you're supposed to do about this? Like, what is the answer to this? So Mark Dagnall was super interesting. He's like, if you really get into it, and Dallas is actually so high, it might not be totally true with Dallas. Mark Dagnall's like, if you really get into it, we're just talking about you're trying to alter five or six possessions. Will's talked about this too. But Mark Daniels like, you're not trying to take it away. You're just trying to slow it down. You can't take it away. So you're trying to just to, to quiet down five, six, seven position. What's a controllable thing that you can do? Is it Can you just take away all of their offensive rebounds? Can you decide you're not fouling? Like, is there something you can do and curtail five, six, seven possessions in a controllable manner? You're, you're going to have to just live with their genius the rest of the time. The... Will Hardy talked about you're just going to have to get much more aggressively defensively. Now, I think this is super interesting because this is really hard to do. I think Will's right, but I, I don't know how to do it. This is actually the quandary that I think is so interesting. So, like, Will's point is, like, you used to be able to sit back, play the drop big defense, keep the guys into certain shots. And Will's like, you'd, he'd take a tough shot, and you'd be like, all right, that's fine. And then 46 points later, you're like, well, maybe that wasn't fine. And 
you're going to have to get much more creative defensively where you're trapping and get aggressively and trying to dictate and trying to alt. You can't let the offense dictate where they're going anymore. Dallas's half-court offense against Phoenix in their loss was a 1.27, a 127, 127 points per 100 possessions. Against Philadelphia, it was a 123 in the half court. Against Indiana, it was a 119 in the half court. Their last three games in the half court, their offense has been a 123. A 123. In the half court. It's mind-blowing. By the way, they lost to the Lakers in there. I'd have to see if that's a game Kyrie didn't play. And, no, Kyrie did play. And their offense was horrendous. If you back up before that, the game before that, they were a 129. That was actually their best offensive performance. In four of their last five games, their offense in the half court has been a 119 or better. Game over. Like, I don't know what you do because if you double, that's the point. Like, if you let Luka go, Luka's going to go get in the half court 1.1. And if you don't let Luka go and you let him spin it around the outside, they're getting an open 40% shot, which is 1.2. And if Luka or Kyrie start driving it, you're dead. So I, I don't, this is crazy what the offensive explosion is. But what's interesting to me is if you look at the best teams in the league, you begin to wonder whether or not the answer, whether the answer is actually you have to be elite defensively. Like that's what we talked about earlier is that the best defensive teams in the league are the best teams. If you look at the top 100 I like to do top 90. Top 90 drive guys, so three on each team. And you look at the best guys in the league efficiency-wise when they drive. Kevin Durant is a 1.22, 122 points per 100 possessions. Luka Doncic is a 122. Kyrie Irving is a 120. I, I, I don't know if I can express to you how mind-boggling these numbers are. The best thing I can probably do is 120. That means if you have 100 possessions, you score 120 points. If we go back to offense five years ago in the 17-18 season, that might be six, but I skipped a bubble year. Like, this is after the offensive explosion. League offensive rating was a 108. And these guys are 20% better than that. Not quite, but close to it league average offense right now if it was 108 five years ago is a 115 right now the off it, this league is unguardable because of talent like two of the guys we're seeing tonight it's truly awe-inspiring and crazy difficult to deal with all right we'll talk about late game watch as well as uh, we'll look at uh, some other little things here uh, as we continue. Uh, and we'll play our lottery, our new game every night. We play, every day we play the lottery. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel, our official sportsbook partner. We talked about FanDuel earlier. So I looked at the odds, and the Jazz are only favored in four of their final 17 games. And uh, in nine of them are a three or more point dog in a game. Uh, FanDuel is the official sports book of Locked On and it is America's number one sports book. And new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That bonus bet is back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sports Book app. It's safe, secure, and easy to use. And then you get to bet on everything from the money line to point scored to threes drained. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance for a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets. It's FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel official sports betting partner. 
of the NBA as well as the official sports book of Locked On. Thanks so much for making Locked On your first listen of the day. Super appreciate it. Locked On NBA Big Board. It's rolling. Great show for the NBA draft. All right. Um, late game watch last night. I had a bunch of things I wanted to get into. Uh, we just talked about the doubling. I, I, we'll see. I mean, I'll look at. I'm going to look at a bunch of data today and try to see like what are the numbers off a of Luca pass. But it's actually usually off multiple Luca passes. And um, I'm going to ask Will about like the analytics of this. Like these guys are so great, and yet you're giving up 40 percent shots. Like what? What's the analytics that like tells you you actually there's something to do? It's why actually what's interesting on this is. Well, first of all, like allowing de- offensive rebounds has become death in a league. You just can't give people extra possessions. Forcing turnovers, which the Jazz are not doing right now because of the way they're playing, seems to be getting maybe more important than ever before. Like the best, the two best turnover teams are Toronto and Oklahoma City. And they're 16th and 13th in the league defensively. Toronto just does not defend the shot. But then Miami, who's the third most common team forcing turnovers is fifth. Cleveland's the fourth most or the third best defense. Minnesota's fifth. They're the eighth best defense. Memphis is sixth. They're the second best defense. So it's an interesting, you kind of get into it, and Indiana's in there. They're bad defensively. Philadelphia's eighth. They're 11th. New Orleans is ninth and ninth. Um, Now we're going to Coffee Garden. That's a reference that three people got. Um, Tenth. Defensively, the seventh. So, of the top ten teams enforcing turnovers, six of them are in the top ten defensively. Seven of them are in the top eleven. It's like, do you have to force turnovers? But if you look at defensive rebounding, the top four defensive rebounding teams are in the top six defensively. I mean, I've been digging into this a lot recently. I know you guys figured this out. The top nine defensive rebounding teams, six of them are in the top nine defensively. How about fouling? Fouling, five of the top 10 defenses are in the top 10 in free throw rate of fouling. So a little less. The fact is, I mean, you got to defend the shot. That's, that's Actually, it's not as graphic as it usually is. That's really interesting. Um, I think you can be good at three of the four, four factors, and then you got to let it go. All right, late game watch last night. I watched the Atlanta game because of Quinn and because I wanted to see. Super interesting. Like, DeJounte Murray actually had the ball most of the time coming in late, and they played Trey off the ball, and Trey was pretty effective off the ball. His first step's pretty quick. He's not dealing with as much traffic. He looks really good. And then late in the game, it came back to Trey on on almost everything, and he was running a lot of uh, his step for uh, Trey starts at the elbow um, in kind of a horn set and then curls off guys to get open. Um, Miami got massive performances from Caleb Martin and Victor Oladipo had a little bit of a bounce there. Um, and Miami won that game. Trey had a bad turnover late to Caleb Martin steal. The interesting play late in the game for Miami, who I feel like has been all over the map trying to figure out who they are. They've gotten much better late in games recently. Went to a three game, three man game of Tyler Hero, Bam and Butler. And they got Kyle Lowry out of the picture. They, I thought they got much better as I've watched them as year goes on. They ran an interesting play late where they ran, Bam kind of at the elbow, and then Butler sets a pick. So it's a middle of the floor spaced. Bam out of Bayou, Jimmy Butler tight pick and roll is their go-to play late. Um, it didn't work. Bam out of Bayou traveled. But that's an interesting little thing. I would think most teams would just switch it. I was surprised they went to that and away from Hero. Hero's been really good um, late in games on that. Cleveland-Boston last night, wild finish. Grant Williams misses both free throws at the end of regulation. Boston's up nine. Boston's lost a ton of leads this year. Like, it's a little disconcerting the amount of leads that Boston's lost this year. Before we go too crazy, Cleveland is the number one differential team in the league, and they, like, seem really good. Uh, It is worth noting that Boston did not have Jason Tatum last night. Uh, They did not have Al Horford last night. They started Blake Griffin at center. They played Mike Muscala 35 minutes. Like, that was not quite the regular Dallas team. Um, But Donovan's passing was outstanding he only ends up with four assists and Darius Garland has 12 but I thought Donovan's passing was as good as I've seen it in a long time Donovan has the ball like that is Donovan's team Donovan is bringing it up Darius Garland's playing off the ball and Donovan scored three big buckets late Boston without Tatum got really stagnant Uh, Brown a lot of isolation strange isolation 
playing off Jalen Brown might be hard. He's not very consistent with all the things um, that he's doing at all times. Um, and that was so that was super interesting to watch. Don was was big time late, be- better than I've seen him be late. He made some kind of wildly difficult, crazy shots, I would say, and they went in, so it could be a little misleading on just make or miss. Um, but he was pretty, he was terrific, and I thought his ball passing and his teamwork was was exquisite in the final five minutes. Don looked really, really good um, in that. Uh, a few other late game watches the other night. I watched Clippers Sacramento. Um, I thought it was inter- Clippers using Westbrook as the pick and roll setter. It's kind of an interesting way to make sure he does it. Uh, I thought Eric Gordon looked awful. Clippers floor spacing looked awful. This is they've played Memphis in one since like amount of times Russell Westbrook kind of runs out of a play and then blows up uh, the floor spacing. Clippers were hitting doubling on. De'Aaron Fox, the minute he crosses half court. Like, we are literally, these guys have gotten so good that we're literally doubling, like, De'Aaron Fox, who's, what, 15th best, 18th best player in the league, but, I mean, really good. The minute he crosses half court. It's crazy. This is just where the league's going. Um, The Clippers worry me that they aren't good enough to switch anymore. They had Nicholas Batum and Eric Gordon on the floor. You can't switch with those two guys. Nick can't move the way he used to. So I think it's going to be really interesting to watch that. Um, and and they were covering it by doubling instead of switching. The Kings did not deal with the double well. They held the ball a lot. They didn't get into anything. They'll have to figure that out for the playoffs. Um, they did get a huge bucket off a of Fox double, and then Monk drives was kind of a four-on-four, four, a nice inside pass to Sabonis, uh, but they were not comfortable um, in that. Um, and... Clippers are playing with Covington at center some of the time because Zubak was out with no Plumlee late and, and it cost them. And and then also Clippers were out of timeouts early. The amount of timeout early guys are out of is kind of crazy. J.B. Bickerstaff last night, I think it was, or somebody, yeah, in that Boston game ended up without a timeout late. That he sh- oh, oh, no, it was Joe Mazzula challenged because, like, he just felt like he had to challenge, but then he actually needed a timeout to advance the ball and he didn't have the timeout anymore. Like, guys... The league is not good at challenging, and the league is not good at preserving timeouts right now. I would say that it's it's hard, but it's there are a lot of games where guys or coaches are wishing they had another timeout, and guys are misusing their challenge. All right, let's go to it. Time for simulation of lottery. Yesterday, what did we end up? We actually should keep a chart of this. I I'll build a chart. We'll actually keep a chart and see how we end up. All right, let's see. Are we ready? Set. Go. Lottery simulation. Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Indiana gets the first pick of the NBA draft. The Washington Wizards get the second pick of the NBA draft. The Detroit Pistons get the third pick of the NBA draft. Houston fourth. San Antonio five. That's the second straight day in which the teams have tanked. Probably hasn't been worth it. Charlotte is six. Orlando gets seven and eight. Oklahoma City at nine. And the Jazz have the 10th pick of the NBA draft. They also have Minnesota's pick, which sits at 18. And the Jazz have the Philadelphia pick, which sits at 27th. What a draft. Every pick, like 5 through 30 would be relevant to us, probably 5 through 40 from a draft scouting standpoint. This is going to be so much fun. That's why I'm going to see if Leaf Tulane's available for a Thursday, for Thursday's show to get you guys ready to start watching them. All right, that was our draft lottery, 10, 18, and 27 today. We'll see how it plays out. Interesting conversation going on in the YouTube chat room, so share and be a part of that as well. Thanks so much for tuning in to Locked On, your team every day.